Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 106 of the CU Insight Experience. This episode is brought to you by our friends at PSCU. We love having them on as a sponsor and for them allowing us to get to have this much fun doing what we do. They are the nation's premier payments CUSO. The folks at PSCU proudly support the success of more than 1,500 credit unions. My name is Randy Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and I'm lucky enough to have conversations with the best and the brightest of the credit union community. I get to pick their brains and see if we can't find a few nuggets that we can all learn from. My guest on today's show is the NCUA chairman, Todd Harper. Chairman Harper was recently appointed to lead the NCUA board by President Biden. You talk about a fun conversation. This is uh, one of the first times I've had the opportunity to have a, a longer conversation with Chairman Harper. I've always respected the work that he's done and, and the way he communicates. Well, you know, I've been watching from afar, so I was really excited to have him on the show. We talked about a lot today. Uh, what was it personally like when he got the nod from President Biden to lead the NCUA? What was his path to getting there? Uh, you know, what did he want to be when he grew up? We talked about inclusion in DEI and credit unions and how we have the ability to be champions here. I really enjoyed the, the leadership section of the show where he shared some of the lessons he's picked up along the way and how he plans to use those experiences going forward with his team. And of course, we talked credit union regulation. What's his approach? What changes does he see coming in the future? What challenges are out there that we're all going to be facing over the next year or two? A cool part of the conversation on what innovation means in credit union regulation. You'll have to listen to that section just to, to find all that out. As always, we wrap up the show with some rapid fire questions. Who does Chairman Harper think of when he hears the word success? He actually had a couple. What's he reading? What does he think we all should be reading? And of course, greatest album, even the greatest song of all time. This conversation was so much fun. I cannot wait to do it again. So with that, I give you my conversation with Chairman Todd Harper. Enjoy. Chairman Harper, welcome to the show. Thank you, Randy. And, and do me a favor, call me Todd. I can do that, but I have to do that up front. It really does have a nice ring to it, I must say, my friend. That, that's good stuff. That's for sure. I, I kind of like it too. So <laughs> I, I have to ask you, there's a couple of questions in here that are completely scratch my own itch that I just you know, maybe we would have gotten to see each other at GAC, but yeah. this year we don't. So what did it feel like when, when you got that tap on the shoulder, the nod that you were going to be the next chairman of the NCUA? First of all, Randy, thanks for having me on the show. And and I feel like I know you extremely well uh, because I've been listening to your podcast for more than a year. In terms of how I felt humbled, in all honesty, to think that the president of the United States has signed an order with your name on it. It's kind of an amazing thing when you think about it, because how many people does that happen to in our population of 330 million people? It's not a lot. So humbled is the first thing I felt. Next thing I felt was grateful. You know, first people I told were my partner of 27 years and my parents. Yeah. And then I also checked in with some of my mentors over the years and my teachers. I'm really grateful to them for the lessons that they gave me, for the things that I learned from them. And one of my teachers, my junior high school math teacher, actually, Pat Montabano, and he sent me an email. And in the email, he said, I want you to do me a favor. And I, Mr. Montabano, what is it? He said, you know, always vote your conscience. Promise me that you'll do that. And I responded to him. I said, I will absolutely do that. Truth is in both of my alma maters for undergrad and graduate school. And, you know, I will seek to do what is best for the system, for the NCUA employees, and for the agency. So I assured him that I would do that. And then lastly, the final thing I felt was emotion. Hard not to be emotional when you get this piece of news. Have you ever seen the movie Working Girl? I have, actually. Yep. I, you know, I, and, and that great last scene where Melanie Griffith goes into her office, on, you know, at Trask Industries, and, and takes a seat at a window office. That is a really emotional moment. And I kind of felt a bit like Melanie Griffith. <laughs> I was emotional. It felt really good. And I think it's okay to be a little emotional because this is a big thing. 
Absolutely. I, congratulations, my friend. I mean, that's amazing. And I remember back when Jill was still at the Connecticut League, we went to an event at uh, Jim Himes' house and he oh, yeah. had something with, you know, President Obama and his signature, his swearing in in the picture. And I was like, well, that has to be cool. So, you know, just you, you've got this piece of paper now with President yeah. Biden's name on it. It does. Amazing. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. You know, I'd like to start with a couple just really big questions, and I know we'll dig down into more details, but for people that don't know you in our credit union space, what is your philosophy as far as regulation is concerned when it comes to, to the credit union movement? I love that question. And one of the things I love about it is it's really who I am. I'm a guy who needs to remember acronyms in order to remember things. And I spent a lot of time thinking this as I was going through the nomination process about what's the acronym and how I'm going to remember it. And ultimately, I came up with the acronym FIRE, F-I-R-E. And it's the first letter of a whole bunch of words. We need to be fair and we need to be forward looking as an agency. We also need to be innovative inclusive and independent. In addition, we need to be risk-focused at the institution when we're examining and ready to act expeditiously if needed. And the last part is I need to be engaged appropriately with all stakeholders. It's one of the reasons why I'm on your show, so that I can hear back and we can develop effective and efficient regulation and supervision. It all comes down to the word fire is what's my philosophy. I love that. That's good stuff. A couple of things in there that you said that I'm really interested in digging into more as we get going. I mean, the innovation side, that's it's sure. wild, the, you know, kind of the world we live in when it comes to how fast things are moving. And, and then also that that equity side, you know, in our household, DEI is a, is a big thing. So it's uh, it's something that I, I was looking forward to talking to you about as well. And, and we'll get down to that. But I want to keep it a little bit higher for the beginning here. When, when you're looking out over the last year, and I will tell you, it, I know you're a listener of the podcast, you know, when uh, I had Antonio on to kick off season three, it was like, I was racking my brains with this, like, I'm, I don't want to say sick of talking about COVID, but it was like, how do we start looking forward? Right? Like every conversation felt so heavy um, <laughs> and I missed the, that forward lookingness of it. So it's a place that I know that there are challenges. I, I listened uh, to you when you were at GAC just a week and a half ago or so. What challenges are you seeing over the next, say, 12 to 24 months for credit unions that you really think are going to take focus for you folks at the NCUA? So, Randy, the first thing I'm definitely looking at is the impact of COVID-19 economy. Right now, credit unions have fared the storm pretty well. Sure, we've lost a full percentage point in terms of the net worth ratio, but it's still above 10%. Uh, And for many credit unions, it's even higher than that. But I want to make sure that we can weather the economic storm ahead. And by that, I mean, if you look at unemployment, usually downturns in the credit union system happen one to two years after uh, you hit a peak in unemployment. So we hit a peak last April, May, and then we started to go down. So you really have to be looking to this May or even the following May as you look into 2022 when something may start to happen. And right now, we've got some things that are masking what could actually happen. Congress has put in place some moratoriums on foreclosures, evictions, and and requirements on forbearances. And that all makes good sense. But at some point in time, we're going to rip that Band-Aid off, and we're going to start to see what is the ultimate effect on the credit union system. And one of the biggest things I'm looking ahead on is the share insurance fund and making sure that it can withstand any challenges that it may have. But it also, I'm going back to what I've been focused on all along, capital and liquidity. You know, part of that seesaw and you need to think about it. I'm also focused on cybersecurity. We know that cyber criminals are hacking into our systems and, 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 and trying to break things down. I'm also focused on consumer financial protection. And during this particular crisis, there are a lot of people who need help. Credit unions traditionally have done a very good job there, but we want to make sure that they're doing the job the right way so the consumer's interests are being protected. And then finally, this is a real reckoning moment for us as a society with diversity, equity, and inclusion, in all honesty. What we have seen with a whole bunch of systemic racism for many centuries, coupled with the exacerbation of what has happened in communities of color, in particular with the pandemic, 
we've really got a moral obligation to step up. The whole credit union movement has to in order to make sure that we have a more equal recovery that's more equitable and is actually helps our democracy. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. I love the way you put that. You know, I want to stick there for one second. I would just say often on when it comes to, to DEI and DEI work, it seems like it can be reactionary, like something big happens, like George Floyd's murder or something of that, and people start talking about it. Do you have any tips or advice? Because I know this is an area that you're passionate about as well on like that CEO who's listening to us right now have this conversation and they don't know what they don't know and they want to take the first step. They do know that. Any thoughts? Any? I mean, I know I put you on the spot on that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a great question. And I would say the first place where they should start is the NCUA self-assessment on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's available at cudiversity.ncua.gov. I talk about it all the time. And it's about 25 questions that just looking at it help to start framing out how you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Before the pandemic began, I was down in Texas and I met with a credit union and I was talking to them about the diversity self-assessment. And I sent it to them at the end of the day. And one of the members of the executive team came back to me and he said, thank you for sharing this. Just reading the questions has changed the way I think. And I realize we can do a little good in the world. And so in my advice is take the survey, figure out where it leads you and start doing a little good in the world, whether that's changing the composition of your board, whether that's changing the composition of your products, whether that's just changing uh, the way in which you recruit membership. That's good. We kind of moved into that already, but now, you know, to go to that innovation side, you know, things are just changing so quick in financial services, not just credit unions, right? Like, I mean, whether it's coming from traditional banks and the big, you know, kind of those too big to fail banks or whether it's the fintechs or Amazon and Apple, right? Like, I mean, whoever it happens to be, I recently was listening to an audio book and part of in that book, it was a uh, thank you for being late. It was the name of the book from a couple of years back, but he was talking about with the pace of change. It is so tough for not just regulators, but Congress, you know, city and local governments to keep track of, you know, and, and the examples he was using was Airbnb. Nobody knew that that was going to disrupt hotels or Uber or whatever it happens to be. So I, I was wondering about that. We are seeing such a fast pace of change. That idea of being fast followers in credit unions doesn't seem to maybe work as much anymore. You need to kind of keep moving along. We've also, I've been so impressed over the past year on how quick pivots were made you know, to be able to serve members during this pandemic. From a regulator's standpoint, how do you keep pace with that change that's happening? So first of all, we have an amazing team at the NCUA and they really are smart. They're dedicated. They're committed to making sure that we stay on top of trends and developments that are happening in in the space. So everyone at the NCUA, whether it's our economists, whether it's our examiners, whether it's the program analyst, whether it's you know just anybody in the organization, in all honesty, is, is looking to see what's happening and what's coming down the trend. And Randy, as I started off this conversation, I talked about the need for the NCUA to be forward-looking. So we are being forward-looking. A couple of ways in which we've done that, Randy. First is our Office of Business Innovation which is um, shepherding through the whole new merit examination system. We're getting rid of the ARIES examination system that we've had for 25 years. And we're going to a much more nimble, more useful platform that is going to provide for a lot better analytics and is going to improve the quality of the reports that we provide to credit unions. It's also going to facilitate the ability of credit unions to provide information to us virtually so that we don't have to spend as much time on site. And I think that's another way in which we're innovating. This whole crisis has helped us to understand how can we do more exam time off site, which will mean less travel, which should keep them a bit happier. But we're still going to need to go into credit unions just to interact, to find out certain information. Another great way uh, we're innovating is our Office of National Examinations and Supervision, which is the entity that looks at the safety and soundness of our largest of credit unions at $10 billion and up in size. They've been developing technology and using it to drill down so that, uh, here's a great example, 
they actually did some analysis and the car model at credit unions with the highest credit union score. You want to take a guess of the name of the, the brand? Ford F-150. <laughs> actually, no, the, the highest credit score is attached to a Tesla. A Tesla. Uh, oh, yeah. No, that makes and, sense. And yep. We're going down and we're diving down and we're using that data to, to develop. We last year hired a number of more cybersecurity specialists because okay. we that the world is changing there and we need to stay on top of it. And just this past year, as part of the budget, one of the things that I was pleased to see in the budget is we have hired, we are in the process now, I should say, of hiring a couple of new people who are focused on financial technology and access and innovation. That's, you know, that's going to help us to stay on top of the trends overall, which is going to be good for the credit union system. And then the one last way is being partners with our fellow state and federal regulators. I really do view that sometimes they're closer to the ground on these things than we are, and we can learn from what they're doing, and they can learn from us in some ways. And one way I know, which we've had some real success, is going back to that Office of Business Innovation and the Merit Examination uh, Program that we're going to be putting in place later this year. We've actually had other regulators come to us and take a look at it because they're replanning their platforms. So we learn from each other. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. That Tesla thing is was really interesting to me. I, that's it's interesting. So high credit scores, care about the planet, forward thinking. <laughs> I remember the reason I said Ford F-150 was because in college, they had us read a book, The Millionaire Next Door. And yeah. the most popular automobile for millionaires was the Ford F-150. <laughs> it was like, oh, that's something. So uh, anyways, random thoughts. Uh, so I was excited to ask you this question. And, and in the beginning, when I asked you what it was like when you, you kind of got the nod, you, you talked about a lot of your mentors and your family and your partner and the people that like you surround yourself with. But, you know, it, it's this idea and I'm a huge believer in it. Like we're shaped by those people we choose to surround ourselves with. Who does Todd surround himself with outside of, you know, work and like who has helped shape you? I can think of a lot of people who've helped. I, I talked about my teachers to start. I want to go back to some of my earliest professional job experiences after finishing college. And when I, I actually started my career as a career civil servant at the Department of Labor more than 30 years ago now. And while there, I got to meet two terrific women, Pat and Lorraine. Uh, both African-Americans, neither of whom went to college, but both of whom started as GS2 secretaries, and by the time they retired, finished as GS15 specialists. And they took me under their wing, and they helped me to understand when to use my woulds, my coulds, my shoulds. They also helped educate me about the workplace dynamic and the politics and how you, you actually need to navigate them and understand where different people sit and stand. And Randy, I will tell you one thing. I uh, have been a mentor to a number of kids back at my alma mater, Indiana University, particularly first generation students and people of color. And uh, I'm paying it forward to Pat and Lorraine for what they did to me. So those are two people who have shaped my career. Another person who really shaped my career was Chuck. Chuck was uh, a chief of staff on Capitol Hill when I first got to know him. He was also the first openly gay man in a workplace that I knew of. And he gave me the courage in some ways to be brave and to come out. And then there are so many people within the credit union system that have helped me over the years. Mike Frizel comes to mind, former uh, board member and chair of the NCUA. John McKechnie is another person who comes to mind at the NCUA as the head of public affairs and legislative affairs. And then actually Catherine Galicia, who is my chief of staff. Catherine and I have known each other for more than 20 years now, close to 25 years, actually. And, you know, between Mike and John and Catherine, I've learned a lot about the financial services system. I've learned even more about credit unions, and I've especially learned a lot about consumer financial protection. And if I were just to think more broadly in my personal life, I am really, really lucky to have some very close friends that go back decades to college and to graduate school together. And one thing I've noticed about them is instead of being intent on tearing each other down or being upset with each other's achievements, all of them work to lift each other up. Uh. It's a remarkable thing. And what's even more remarkable is uh, JT, another friend of mine, 
We were rivals in student government uh, back at Indiana University. JT's ticket ran against the ticket on which I was running on. But, you know, we buried the hatchet a long time ago and became really good friends. And JT is actually the head CEO of the Alumni Association now. And he sent me a note when I became chairman, and it meant the world to me. He said, as a credit union member, I feel assured. As your friend, overjoyed. And as a fellow alumni, I am proud. And, and find good people. Surround yourself with them. Life's too short to be negative, in all honesty. And keep the positivity going. And that's what I do, Randy. Oh, I, I absolutely love that. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. So this is interesting. It sounds like government, being a civil servant, was always in your blood or in your, uh, your the idea of which direction you wanted to go. You mentioned student government at your, your alma mater there. Was there a point where credit unions came into that picture? Was there a point, I guess, also where you looked at this and you said, this is my career path. Like, I want to be in government. So, you know, first of all, service is built into who I am. My grandmother and grandfather were volunteers. My mother's a huge community leader. She was a teacher for many years. And so public service is in my blood. When I went to college, I didn't join just a standard fraternity I actually joined a co-educational service fraternity that focused on volunteering and giving back, Alpha Phi Omega. And so it's in my blood. And I've been in government now for 27 years. But when did that moment happen where the credit union switch got flipped? And it would have been the late 90s. And it was when I was working for Congressman Paul Kanjorski, who some of your listeners may remember was the lead Democratic sponsor of the Credit Union Membership Access Act, uh, which overturned a Supreme Court's decision. And uh, I was working for the congressman and Mike Radway, who was his legislative director at the time, who ultimately went on to become Rick Metzger's chief of staff. But Mike announced that he was going to move to the West Coast to be with his fiance. And the congressman and his chief of staff came to me and said, hey, will you be our next legislative director? And I said, absolutely. And then they asked, well, will you also do the banking committee portfolio? And I said, no way. I I did not want to do economic policy. I I, I wanted to be on the softer side of regulation, the healthcare regulation, the labor law, the um, environmental law, that's, and corporate citizenship. I wrote my graduate thesis uh, at the Kennedy School on the issue of corporate citizenship. And so those are where my desires were. But I gotta tell you, the Congressman was incredibly persuasive as was his chief of staff. And within a few months, uh, because Mike wasn't moving immediately, they had gotten me to a place saying, try it for a year, see if you like it. And that was the year right after the credit union membership access became law that um, we actually did what would become Graham Leach Bliley. And for me, it really, changed my world and changed my outlook overall. That was the moment that I started to say, hey, maybe this is my career. Maybe this is it. So was there an inspiration when you accepted you know, a position with the NCUA? And was that something I'm always intrigued? It's a question I ask CEOs. Is it, is it something you were actively pursuing? In all honesty, I wasn't, although I was looking for a job. The congressman lost in 2010, and I knew I needed to find a new job. And uh, one day, Debbie Matz, who was chairman of the agency at that point in time, sent uh, somebody down to come and talk to me and ask me, would I be interested? And I said, I don't know if I would, but I got to tell you, Debbie Matz, uh, she was just tireless in her efforts. And and this would have been December. And uh, the month of December, we were having this conversation in 2010. And by the start of January of 2011, I had realized this was going to be a really good place for me. And I'm so glad that she stayed dogged in her pursuit and pulled me in because I've learned, you know, not only do I like credit union policy, but I love the people at this agency. My whole heart is in the work of the NCUA and what it does. And, you know, I have a really special sort of responsibility, Randy. I am the first NCUA staffer to have become a board member and now chairman. And so I've got a special responsibility back to staff 
uh, so that I lead and do it well so that others might follow me. Following your footsteps. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize that. That's amazing. So let me ask you that. That's So that's interesting. You went from staff to a board member. Now you're the chairman. Has the inspiration changed with the weight of the title, the gig? <laughs> So I've always approached leadership is to be a servant leader, that is to listen and to learn and support. And so I don't know that that part of my job has necessarily changed, but I have found inspiration in new ways. One of the things I do is saying thank you to staff. After every board meeting, I make an effort to try and reach as many of the staff who are involved with that board meeting and reaching out and just saying thanks to them. Another thing is I want to be one of them, and it's why I tell them to call me Todd because I don't want myself on a pedestal and I want them to understand that I'm part of the team and working with them as part of the team. And then I get really inspired, Randy, by the stories that I hear when I go out to credit unions. And I used to get in the field quite a bit before the pandemic started. One of the most amazing stories I heard in the field was about a woman who was having trouble. They were constantly getting small dollar loans. And this time she had gone to her credit union to get a a loan to buy new tires for the car. Something necessity. Well, she just happened to be bringing a bucket of her tamales along that day. And I got to tell you, it's my understanding because I've talked to the loan officer, those tamales just smelled amazingly delicious. And and I've actually actually smelled those tamales later. And I agree that they smell amazingly good. And the loan officer in writing this check to them so that they could go buy new tires said, have you ever thought of starting your own business? And and the woman said, no, she hadn't. What do I need to do to start my own business? Well, you know, do you have a kitchen where you can cook the tamales? Yeah, I've got a kitchen. Do you have the equipment? Yeah, I've got the equipment. Do you have a license? No, I don't have a license. Do you have an extra car in order to go and, and get things, you know, to and from? And do you have the food? No, I don't have the food. That credit union wrote a $500 check initially. Yeah. That same woman has grown her business more and more into a food truck and into a catering business. It changed a life. And thank God that the loan officer had the presence enough to say, you know, do you want to start a business? Because this woman's family is on the road to financial independence. Absolutely. And it all changed because of credit union. So I find inspiration in those stories, Randy. That could be... It's generational, even independence, right? Like, I mean, that's that's good stuff. I think I told the story very early on in the podcast, but at our very first office that we had for CU Insight back when we used to have an office, the woman who owned the business across the hall from us owned a uh, dog collar company down in Greenville, South Carolina. And when she found out that we worked with credit union, she goes, my credit union gave me a personal loan that got me out of my dining room into my first sewing, you know, all of this. And she's like, that personal loan was actually what started Pawpaws USA. If you're looking for dog colors, hands amazing. But it was our first connection points. We're friends a decade later now still, but she, it was uh, a credit union that helped her. So a very similar story, right? Like, I love uh, that. So I, kind of going back, since you know you mentioned that you came up in the NCUA over the past few years in different roles. So I think this is a uh, even a more relevant question now for that person, you know, often we hear about people having to leave for that advancement. We do hear often in credit unions of people that rose all the way up through the organization to CEO. But if you were, you know, a listener who's out there who who is striving for that next career role, they want more out of that career. Do you have any, I guess, tips, life hacks, whatever you want to say about, you know, on how to either create that opportunity or what they should do? Sure. I mean, first of all, service is really a calling and you have to be called into the credit union movement in order to really appreciate the power of bringing cooperatives, bringing people together and helping people to finance their lives through um, access to affordable loans and budgeting and, and teaching people how to save for the future and just improving their overall well-being. But the piece of advice I would give to your listeners about getting to that next opportunity I would say network. I would also say, be kind to everybody. There have been so many people that I've met over the years that I've encountered in different roles. And really, if you're kind to everybody, good things will find you. I was one of those that actually had left the NCUA for a couple of years before coming back to it. It was actually two of the best years of my life in terms of being able to unplug, I call it the great vacation in some 
because that's what it really was. Believe in yourself. That's another thing that I have to say. Believe you can do it. And if you believe you can do it, that's a lot of the momentum that takes you forward. That's good stuff. You've mentioned kindness. You've mentioned being a servant leader. So again, I feel like things you're saying are just making me really excited to ask you the next question. Um, (laughs) But as you know, it's not tough to find purpose in credit unions. But Chairman Harper, how do you find purpose and make sure that you're staying true to your purpose in your current role, but also outside of credit unions in your personal life? So we do it for our businesses. We need to do it for ourselves. Write a personal mission statement read it often. I wrote mine a few years ago and mine reads something to the effect of in life, I will be a principled and optimistic individual who uses my knowledge, skills, and talents to bring people together and make the world a better place. And as a leader, I will be collaborative and visionary in bringing diverse teams together to solve challenging problems and obtain high performance as an individual, I will continue to grow personally and positively work towards change. And then finally, you got to take time to give back to others. That's how I find purpose. Oh, I love it. Is there something that you used to do that you just don't find yourself doing anymore? And you're like, why did I stop doing that? Yeah, I used to write handwritten thank you notes to people all the time. <laughs> I keep a drawer in my office. I've been to the office three times right? Yeah, <laughs> in the last year, but there's a drawer in my office that every once in a while when you're having that bad day, I open it up and it's thank you notes that I've gotten, whether they're emails or handwritten notes from somebody. And, and one of my favorite notes in that desk drawer is Mary Shapiro wrote to me. Mary Shapiro was the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission from about 2009. I think she stayed all of years. I I have a hard time remembering. But Mary sent me this personal note thanking for the work that I did and working on investor protection issues in the Dodd-Frank Act. And between my Senate counterpart and I, we managed to get about 20 or so investor protection rules added into the legislation that became law. And to me, it was like the chairman of an agency is taking the time to write me this note. That really means something. I need to get back to writing notes. I know that picking up the phone and calling people and sending them emails is nice, but that handwritten note, it's an extra touch. And I wish I did more of it. Uh, Is there a myth about being a great leader that you just think is dead wrong? Kind of makes your skin crawl if you hear it. Absolutely. I I, I was hoping you were going to ask this question, Randy. And I got to say, the myth is that you have to be strong. We, in our view, have this idea that you know, you need to be strong like a World War II general. Right. That's like John Wayne or something, right? <laughs> and, 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 and what I've learned over time, to be a really good leader, there are three things you need. The first thing you need is a vision. What is your strategic plan? What are you thinking? Where do you want to lead to? That's number one. Number two is your voice, how you communicate. Uh, because if you have the vision and can't communicate it, You can't necessarily get the job done. And I've had to work on my voice. People find this really, really strange, Randy. I'm a math guy, but I evolved into a language guy. My SAT scores, I had 780 on the SAT. My verbal was in the 500s. And people don't believe it because I've spent so many years working to improve my communication skills. But my mother was observed when I became chairman. She said, I kind of find it funny that the kid who spoke numbers and in math has used language to now head an agency dealing with numbers and math. And numbers. <laughs> uh, but early on in my career, I was very stilted. I was very formal uh, in how I wrote my letters. And I had several great mentors that helped me to soften my tone and show empathy to gain allies. And that leads me Randy, to the third thing. And so it's the vision, it's the voice, and it's vulnerability. I learned that as a leader, you really need to connect with people one-on-one. And if you can connect with people one-on-one by showing your vulnerabilities, by maybe talking about your past health issues, maybe talking about events that have happened in your life, that will only strengthen the commitment and bond and that people will follow you. So, you know, you don't have to be a strong individual to be a leader. 
be a caring, be an empathetic, be vulnerable, and you will go a really long way. Uh, that's good stuff. Outside of credit unions, what do you do to recharge? What does this work-life balance or integration look like to you? So first of all, I try to keep my weekends, if at all possible. I'm okay with working long hours during the week, but I try to keep my weekends. I need to have a long vacation each year, and it's got to be one week just is not a long vacation. It takes about that to wind down, right? So, <laughs> and, and there are two places where you are likely to find me on that vacation. One is in a mountain cabin in the middle of summer, preferably next to a lake, or if it's the middle of winter, next to an ocean. Yeah. In both places, I'll have a book in my hand, and I will be reading that. I also find ways to recharge by sleeping in on the weekends. It's when I read the newspaper cover to cover. I have that cup of coffee. I know you like to do crosswords and Sudokus. Right? <laughs> I'm a big crossword and Sudoku fan. And Saturdays are usually the hardest of the week. So if I can work my way through that, I feel pretty darn good about myself. And the last thing I do is I recharge with friends. I like to entertain with them. I've got a group of friends. We've been having supper club together for more than 20 years, oh. and once a quarter. And it's just people who I can let my hair down with. We all do very different things. And it's nice to have those connections. So that's how I recharge. Uh, I, I love that idea of getting together quarterly with just a group of people that you've known for years and sharing a meal. Yep. So you, as you know, you've listened, it wouldn't be the CEO Insight Experience podcast without some rapid fire questions. I've mixed in a few new ones this year, uh, but held on to some of the old that I, that I absolutely love. So uh, as always, questions are rapid. Your answers don't have to be. So <laughs> uh, what is something that you've said no to? in your life that you're sure glad you did? As I finished graduate school and I was looking for a job, I was engaged in discussions about going to the Office of Management and Budget. And I got a call on a Friday at four o'clock in the afternoon asking me to take a job and that I needed to tell them by the end of the day whether I was going to take a job. And the job would have been doing military health care policy. Okay. It was Friday at four o'clock and I said, can't I have at least the weekend to think through it? And one of the reasons why is I had just started engaging in discussions with Congressman Jorsky's office. Okay. I thought I was going to get it and I really wanted to work on Capitol Hill. And I ended up saying no to the job at OMB I ended up getting the job with Congressman Ken Jorsky the next week. Actually, I started the next Thursday. And I'm so grateful I did. And I think that's a really powerful message for people to be in control of your career. Sometimes it's okay to say no. Couldn't agree more. What were you like when you were young in high school? I love to ask the question. Was there any memorable trouble you got in that you can share with us? Uh, so what was I like in high school? I was an overachiever. I was in the top 10 of my class academically. I was yearbook editor and co-president of student council. I ran cross country. I actually played in the chess club. I was in band. I was in choir. I was, you know, I was the kid who did everything and probably burned myself out in some ways. I will also say this, that I never felt quite at home in high school um, because I wasn't sure where I fit in. And the most remarkable conversations I had a few years ago, Randy, was with my friend Matt, who we went to grade school together, junior high together and high school. And we went even to the same college, although we didn't really see each other all that much in college. And Matt and I got together and we were talking. He said, you were the one kid in high school who fit in with every group. I was really surprised to hear that. And he said, no, that's always been the secret your success that you actually did fit in, even though if you felt you didn't fit in. I was just going to say, that's interesting. He thought you fit in with everybody. You didn't feel you fit in with anybody. And Randy, in some ways, maybe that's because I was still dealing with who I was as a gay man. Uh, and that there's an awkwardness as you go through that stage in, in life. So that's what I was like in high school. And you asked about memorable moment when I got into trouble. Nobody is ever going to be Diane Dykstra. No, no, of course not. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto, I, I think, is just, you know, that's over the top. But I, I had kind of a similar story to Diana. And that is, um, I took mom and dad's car and went to prom with a friend of mine. And a big thing that we used to do is after prom was all done and the after party was done, you would drive to downtown Chicago so that you could take pictures with the skyline of Chicago. And I was about, it was about a half hour from where I grew up. 
to get to downtown Chicago from where I lived in Indiana. And so we drove downtown and on our way back on the south side of Chicago, we stopped at a stop sign and I was rear ended. And then I hit the car in front of me because I didn't have the car in neutral. I just had my foot on the brake. And so I crashed mom and dad's car. And I will say this, thank God we were double dating with my cousin because she could verify every aspect of the story. And mom and dad didn't think that I had been doing something silly or different. I hadn't been drinking. It's just, I crashed mom and dad's car. You crashed the car on prom night. That's that's pretty good. You, you mentioned when you have some time away, uh, having the book. What are you currently reading? And uh, is there a book that you just think everybody should read or one that you've gifted people over yeah. here? So I have just finished reading The Color of the Law, uh, Richard Rothstein, and it's about how we use segregation laws, whether it was in education, housing, transportation, you name it, really to create a two-tiered class society, those that have and those that have not, and those who have not are Black Americans. And and we really need to do more. And I, I recommend the book simply because it gives you a better understanding how red line existed yeah, yeah. and how people were denied educational opportunities, or even in fact, Randy, white veterans and soldiers could come home and could get FHA loans uh, from the veterans administration, but black Americans couldn't. And it really helps you to understand some of those disparities and how they played out. Next on my list, I love all of Eric Larson's books. Devil in the White City uh, comes to mind is probably his best uh, but it's the Splendid in the Vile. I, I want to find a long weekend and just sit down and read that book. In terms of books that I've given in, in the workplace, though, there are two. The first is Strengths Finders 2.0. Are you familiar with it? That book I've heard of for sure, um, but I'm not, I don't know if I've read it. It's a phenomenally interesting book because they break down and say that instead of trying to compensate for your weaknesses, you should lead with your strengths. And they've identified that there are 34 strengths that are out there in the world. And you take this aptitude test where this or that, this or that, this or that, and you answer these 180 questions very quickly. And then it spits out what your top five talents are. And it gave me some real insights as to what my talents were that I could never quite put a word on. But the even more brilliant thing about this book is it gave me a neutral language in which to talk about conflict. I'll give you a great example. One of my strengths is focus. When I see something, I stay focused on it and I want to get it done and I want to get it done quickly. Debbie Matz, she's a maximizer. She wants to keep do more, 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 more. We got to do this. We got to do this. And Debbie's maximization would come up against my focus. And when I knew that that was what was happening, I could just say, Debbie, we've got to slow down and we've got to plan this out in a more strategic way. And it helped us to overcome some differences. And I've used it in, you know, with my team and how we communicate and react with each other. The other book I read more recently is Leadership Without Easy Answers. Oh, uh, I highly recommend one. the book. It's by Ronnie Heifetz. Ronnie Heifetz's uh, grandfather was a world-renowned violinist. His father was a world-renowned surgeon. And Ronnie went to medical school and said, not for me. He dropped out. Imagine, imagine telling your grandfather and father, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be a doctor. And he ended up uh, studying the field of leadership. And Ronnie's great insights are that sometimes leaders have to help organizations understand problems that they have that they're not seeing. Yeah. What Martin Luther King did with the civil rights movement it was helping to raise awareness about a problem that was out there. Gandhi did the same thing in India. Or LBJ, when he was president, he knew that people weren't getting the right to vote and that we needed to do the Voting Rights Act. And how he helped bring the public along, educate people. It's a really powerful book to read as a leader. And I'm certainly one of the things that I see in the credit union system that we need. We do it generally well but there are ways we can do it better is consumer financial protection. So I'm turning to that book at times to remind myself, what are the lessons that I need to do in order to help people to understand the problem and help to fix the problem? I'm going to have to pick that one up. I, I thought about the questions when you were talking about, I think I've taken that test before, but I've never read the book, like taking it online or something. You got to do it both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. So you I have to do it both the, together. I, I took the shortcut. Oh. <laughs> the random question. What's the greatest album of all time? I can tell you the greatest song of all time, um, Respect by Aretha Franklin. Uh, 
It's an anthem of the civil rights movement. It's an anthem of the feminism movement. And it happened to be released a few weeks before I was born. A couple of weeks after I was born, it was number one. So uh, there you go. Yep. <laughs> it's big in the soundtrack of my life. I'm also going to tell you this, Randy. I'm kind of a best of album guy. I, I don't like buying songs that I don't like. So yep. why am I going to spend the money on the record? And that's one of the beauties right now. You can just buy the songs that you like on the MP3 players. Queen's Greatest Hits and, and uh, Madonna's Immaculate Conception. But if you want a really pure, pure, pure album, first album I ever bought, Ghost in the Machine by The Police. Uh-huh. Really, really, that album to this day, I can play it back and forth. Tracy Chapman's first album called Tracy Chapman, which Fast Car. It's the only time I have ever bought an album after hearing just one song. Okay. <laughs> I remember the song well, yeah. My, my my ultimate ultimate album. I'm going to go with George Michael and Faith. Uh, Faith, yeah, it that gets me dancing too. every single time. My first purchase was also Police. It was Synchronicity. So okay, yeah. <laughs> actually, we're we're of that same era because yep. those two albums came out right next to each other. <laughs> yep. I was thinking the same thing as you were listing all your albums. I'm like. We were right there together. So <laughs> so I normally don't send this question, as you know, from listening in advance, but I didn't want to get Joe in trouble with you. So um, <laughs> when you hear the word success, who's the first person that comes to mind? So I, I know a lot of your listeners and, and, and people who've been on the show say their mom and my mom's at the top of my list. She divorced when I was very young. She had the courage to do it at a time when people really weren't divorcing all that much. She found the most wonderful man who became my dad, and they've been married for nearly 50 years. She taught me the value of developing strong relationships uh, and how important that is. And she also changed the lives of the children she taught in the classroom and the communities in which she's lived in. I would typically say my mom, except that I had a conversation with a CEO a few months ago at a credit union. I can't tell you her name uh, because we're the regulator. But after I got done listening to her, she runs a credit union that operates the only branch in a zip code in an urban area, and and there are no other financial institutions in the zip code. So it's, it's chronically underserved. And she was talking to me about what it was like during the pandemic to provide the small dollar loans to help get people buy, how she was, they were reworking loans and how she would hire new tellers and they would quit three days later, and how she was having this constant staff churn in the midst of the pandemic, and how she kept coming every single day in, you know, into work. And what she was doing really was changing lives. And it's a bit like George Bailey, and it's a wonderful life. So I'm going to call her Georgette. That's not her. There we go. (laughs) And I, at the end of that conversation, I said, Georgette, do you ever listen to Randy's show? And she said, yeah. I said, do you ever hear that question about success? And she said, yeah. I said, you're my definition of success. You're changing lives. And this, this is what the credit union movement is all about. So Georgette is my example of success. Well, now I have a selfish ask of you, if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing or asking if she could share. It sounds like she'd be an amazing person to have on the show in the future. So <laughs> uh, as so long as you don't connect it, I'm happy. To if I don't that. connect the two and you, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll wait some time, but, <laughs> or maybe Georgette can just reach out when she listens. So, <laughs> uh, well, that is the perfect way to wrap up the show. Thank you again for taking the time. You know, I wish you the best in your tenure as chairman. My last question. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share or asks of our listeners today? So I'm really just going to close with something I've been signing my emails often with during the pandemic, and it's be safe, be well, be kind. Uh, I absolutely love that. It's That sounds very similar to what Brian Schools from uh, Chartway Credit Union is also has one that's like that too. And I've been I kind of stole from him and I'm stealing from you. It sounds like the be well part of, but I love the be kind also. Uh, well, thank you again. We'll link to everything we talked about in the show notes so people can you know get more information. If people have questions of you, I'm sure after listening to this, they'll probably have a, a, a bunch. Do you have a poison email, Twitter? The LinkedIn machine. <laughs> yeah, first, uh, I love LinkedIn. And if anybody wants to connect with me and they're in the credit union system, I will connect with you. Although I'm not really good at checking uh, mails there. So if they want to have something that's more time sensitive or urgent, send an email to bmharper at ncua.gov. That is perfect. We'll link to that too. Again, thank you. And I, I hope you have a great day and, and be well, my friend. Absolutely. You too.
Before we go, I just want to take a quick minute to thank first all of you for listening today. It is so greatly appreciated. And once again, a thank you to Chairman Harper for taking the time out of his busy schedule to share his experiences and his goals with all of us. And a big thank you to our sponsor, PSCU. Our our friends at PSCU have been longtime partners and supporters of ours, so please make sure to click on their link in the show notes and give them some love. See everything they have going on to help the credit union community. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast player, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon now, I think. It's, It's we're everywhere. You can find us. Hit the subscribe button. We greatly appreciate it. Again, thank you so much for listening. I hope you have an amazing day and please be well, friends. Mm